the Monday evening, both Oswald and Kennedy had been buried, and the inquest begun. All investigations focused on the lone gunman theory, and within two weeks, a detailed FBI report declared the guilt of Lee Harvey Oswald. Secret Service reenactments supported their conclusions. In March the following year, a sentence was passed on Jack Ruby. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment and assess his punishment at death. Sign Meanwhile, the Warren Commission, charged by President Johnson to find the truth, operated almost entirely in secret. Based in Washington, the commissioners finally came to Dallas. Their spokesman was former CIA director Alan Dulles. Are you convinced that he was shot from the school book depository? Well, I think we better leave all that, you know. And I, not, uh, the evidence report will cover all of, all of that, and we'll get into that. But uh, that Are question you... might lead to a lot more. And uh, you know, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, also came with Commissioner Gerald Ford, a future president. The prime purpose of their visit was to interview Jack Ruby, who had appealed against his sentence. A frightened man, he claimed he could not talk freely in Dallas and begged eight times to be taken to Washington to testify. The commissioners left, ignoring his pleas. Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. The people have, have so much to gain and have such a material motive to put me in a position I'm in. The Warren Report concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, killed President Kennedy. Incarcerated in his cell overlooking Dealey Plaza for another two and a half years, Jack Ruby suddenly contracted cancer and died at Parkland Hospital. With his silence permanently guaranteed, Ruby's body was flown to Chicago, the place of his birth, for burial. Only now, a quarter of a century after the president's death in Dallas, is the appalling truth behind his assassination and its cover-up revealed. Secretary Marilyn Sitzman, on the morning of the assassination, joined her boss, Abraham Zabruder, an enthusiastic home movie maker, on the grassy knoll. His film of the passing motorcade was to become the most detailed and gruesome record of the president's death. We were looking around to see where would be a good place to be. And he looked here and he said, well, just standing up here would be a good shot. But he said, I, I got vertigo and I can't stand up there by myself. Would you stand behind me and hold on to me? I said, sure, why not? So he gets up here, I get up behind him, and I'm holding on to him. And he started filming about, oh, just before they came around the corner. And we're filming, they come around the corner and start coming down and they're, you know, waving at everybody. And then we heard what to me sounded like two firecrackers. You know, it was, it was starting to get a little confusing because you could see things happening in the car. And you, you didn't quite get what was happening until they got right here in front of us in the third shot, hit Mr. Kennedy right in his head. We knew what happened. This harrowing footage, after examination by the FBI, was immediately purchased by the publisher's Time Life and locked away from public scrutiny. Were it not for photo analyst Robert Groden, who gained access to the original and worked on it secretly, its real significance may have remained hidden forever. We had been told that the president had been shot from behind, from the Texas School Book Depository. If that had happened, he would have been thrown forward, the transfer of momentum of the bullet striking him in the rear of the head. But what we saw was the exact opposite. When he was struck, he was thrown to the rear and to the left, indicating a shot from the grassy knoll. The knowledge that we had been lied to scared me. Yeah, I felt if anybody knew what I knew, that I'd be in a great deal of danger. So I didn't tell anybody. I quietly worked on the film for years. The more evidence that I was able to develop in the film, for instance, the timing of the shots, when the first shot was fired, uh, which was a lot earlier than the Warren Commission had told us, at a point when Oswald had even up in that window, could not have fired the shot until the most frightening, horrifying physical aspects, the nature of the wounds to the president's head, which are visible in some frames after the headshot, much clearer than anything the public has ever been allowed to see. Living with that became a horror, trying to keep that, afraid of being discovered that I knew that. That's, that's what frightened me the most. The Warren Commission ignored the film evidence of a shot from the front. They were also selective in their choice of eyewitness testimony. Two members of the Willis family 
told them of hearing shots fired from behind the president's car. However, other vital evidence they tried to offer went unrecorded. The implication was persuasion, yes, ma'am, because uh, all they wanted to know was three shots and that probably came from the depository building, which I never have doubted. That's about all they wanted. They about all got into the Warren Commission. They I heard three loud shots from the Texas depository. The headshot seemed to come from the right front. It seemed to strike him here, and uh, his head went back, and it, all of the brain matter went out the back of the head. It was like a red halo, a red circle with bright matter in the middle of it. It just went like that. It was a, a terrible time. You cannot imagine seeing this. You, you knew it happened, but you didn't want to believe it. The particular headshot must have come from another direction besides behind him because the back of his head blew off, and it doesn't make sense to be hit from the rear and still have your face intact. So he must have been hit from another position, you know, possibly, you know, in the front or over to the side. I, I really don't know where but the back of his head blew off. So I am very dead certain at least one shot, including the one that took the president's skull off, had to come from the right front. And I'll stand with that to my death. It's over my mother's grave. <laughs> The doctors at Parkland Hospital who tended the president minutes after the assassination also saw a head wound compatible with a shot from the front. I can see that he had a large, uh, about seven centimeter opening in the right occipital parietal area. And considerable portion of the brain was missing there and uh, the occipital cortex, the back portion of the brain was lying down near the opening of the wound and blood was trickling out. Almost a fifth or perhaps even a quarter of the right back part of the head in this area here had been blasted out along with probably most of the brain tissue in that area. The president's body was flown in Air Force One directly from Dallas to Washington. Accompanied by Jackie Kennedy, the ornamental bronze casket was unloaded at Andrews Air Force Base, apparently to be driven straight to the Naval Medical Center at Bethesda for the official autopsy. It was here that Commanders Humes and Boswell, with Colonel Fink, were making their preparations for the autopsy of the century. Assisting them was medical technician Paul O'Connor. The morgue door burst open, and six or seven men came carrying this casket in and set it on the floor next to the uh, table, autopsy table. As I remember, this casket was a type of casket that was a cheap shipping type of casket. What I mean by shipping casket is that it's not a very ornamental casket. It's not very expensive. Uh, it's a very plain casket. This is not the casket in which Al Reich placed the president's body at Parkland Hospital, Dallas. It was a uh, expensive bronze color type casket. It was a bronze casket. Uh, one of the most expensive that we had in stock. Uh, it was a white satin lining inside the casket. Uh, we uh, wrapped him in one of the sheets and uh, just placed him in the casket. The casket was opened, and inside was a slate gray rubber body bag with a zipper that ran from the head all the way down to the toes. It's, it's the kind of body bag that you find people that, that were carried out of a disaster in. We unzipped the body bag, and inside was the body of the president. And we put the body on the table. There was, he, was, he was nude, no, no clothes on, but he had a white sheet, a bloody white sheet wrapped around his face and his head. So between Parkland Hospital in Dallas and the autopsy in Washington, the president's body had mysteriously been placed in another casket and also wrapped differently. Since the autopsy, there has also been a major discrepancy in the description of the president's fatal head wound. It would be a jagged wound 
that involved the half of the right side of the back of the head, my initial impression was that it probably was an exit wound. So it was a very large wound. This is not what the official autopsy photographs show. Hidden away for a quarter of a century and shown here for the first time, they reveal the back of the head intact. The autopsy photographs show a massive wound, but it's in the right temporal area and into the parietal area, which is behind it, between the two. It is inconceivable to me that every single one of the witnesses who saw the president's head could be wrong, and specifically wrong, about this particular wound. They describe an avulsed, exploded, open wound in the rear of the head. In the autopsy photographs, you saw, see a small, neat wound of entrance. It's obvious to me that those photographs have been faked. When I first saw the pictures of the president's body, so-called wounds, what really struck me was, especially the head wounds, they showed a nice little neat round bullet hole in the back of his head. Well, actually what I saw was the whole side of his head blown off. It was gone. I don't know where those things came from. But they're totally wrong, every one of them. In 1964, the Warren Commission dealt with this evidence by not looking at it. It was made available to them. They felt if they looked at it, they would have to deal with it and publish it. So they didn't deal with it. In 1977, around that time frame, the House Assassinations Committee had the photographs. What they did with it was even less excusable. They had the photographs, they had the questions that were brought to them about the photographs, and they did not allow the Dallas doctors, the most important witnesses in this particular area of the evidence, to even view them. And the reason seems quite clear. If they have the best eyewitnesses looking at the photographs saying it's not the condition of the president's head, then you not only have a conspiracy to kill the president, but absolute proof of the conspiracy to cover it up after the fact, because the only people who had the photographs were the government. If somebody faked those photographs, it was someone within the government, someone who had access to those photographs. But there are further disturbing indications of manipulation of the medical evidence in the hours prior to the autopsy of Bethesda. Tell us, Dr. Robert McClelland. I would estimate that about 20% to 25% of the entire brain was missing. At any normal autopsy involving such gunshot wounds, the brain would have been sectioned and the bullet tracks traced and all bullet fragments examined. This was not done. The vehement critic of the government's handling of the medical evidence is also one of the world's leading forensic pathologists, Dr. Cyril Wecht. If the brain was not sectioned, then there could be no visualization of its interior. It's as if it never existed. I am very, very suspicious. And I do think that it could have been uh, the, uh, the height of a sinister uh, conspiratorial activity in the post-assassination cover-up in this case to uh, make sure that the brain was not examined in order to be able to disprove or at least to be able to withhold uh, the attempts by other people, me and other critics, to prove that there was a second gunman firing from the right side. Because again, you see, that gets to the question of whether or not there was a conspiracy. Another long-standing critic of the official version of events has pursued the truth through the Freedom of Information Act, acquiring valuable documents which he believes prove a cover-up at the highest level. Former Senate investigator Harold Weisberg. Lee Harvey Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby on Sunday, the 24th of November. Nicholas Katzenbach was the acting attorney general and the deputy attorney general, and he knew immediately that Oswald wasn't going to be tried. They didn't have to put this evidence into court. So he takes a lawyer's yellow legal pad, he writes out in longhand, a memorandum to Bill Moyers, that was a channel to Lyndon Johnson. And in essence, he says, we got to convince the world that Oswald was a lone assassin and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted if he'd gone to trial. This is before they collected any evidence. This was Monday morning, Monday after the assassination. The Dallas police were still collecting evidence and had to be stopped. After Oswald's death, the FBI swiftly requisitioned all the physical evidence much to the chagrin of police chief Jesse Curry. I had a request, and I, I have it here, where Mr. Wade requested uh, 
Is it our request that you turn all of the evidence obtained in the investigation of Lee Oswald's assassination of the president over to the FBI for mailing to Washington? We're turning all of our physical evidence over to the FBI. This was on the direct orders of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Do you have the greatest police agency in the world? They're supposed to keep the president alive. He's killed in broad daylight on the streets of a modern American city. How can Hoover possibly admit that he couldn't know about this and he couldn't prevent it? There was only one way, by having a nut who was all alone do it. There was nobody to squeal on. So, from the beginning, J. Edgar Hoover had an instant vision. Oswald was a lone nut assassin, and that's all that anybody ever considered anybody in official position. You can say, let me try and understand what the government did, how it worked this way. And you can understand that maybe for a couple of days, they didn't want the truth to come out because they, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't want to frighten people. They wanted to preserve domestic tranquility. Was it going to be an attack on Lyndon Johnson or the Secretary of State? Was it going to be an invasion from abroad? Was this the beginning of a revolution? Those kind of things have to enter the thoughts of the people in, in authority in Washington. After a couple of days, when everybody knew this wasn't happening, then there's no excuse for the lie. The lie was that Oswald, poor shot, fired his three bullets from the sixth floor window of the book depository in under seven seconds. No expert marksman has ever achieved this feat. The Warren Commission, basing its findings on the earlier FBI report, at first said two bullets had hit Kennedy, one in the back, one in the head, and one bullet had hit Governor Connolly. Their conclusions were thrown into disarray by eyewitness James Tague. Standing right at the east end of the triple underpass on the sidewalk between the main and commerce. And when the first shot, which I thought was a firecracker, happened and heard two more, I ducked behind the triple underpass and actually did not see too much of what was going on until I looked out and the presidential limousine was going right by me under the underpass. At that time, Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters said, you have blood on your cheek. I reached up, and there was a couple of drops of blood. And at that time, I remembered something had stung me during the shooting. He says, where were you standing? We walked back, and from about 40 feet away, we noticed a mark on the curb, a very fresh mark. The FBI sends some agents from Dallas, and they file a report that says there's no mark there. It must have been eradicated by the brushes using to sweep the streets. You know, there'd be no streets left in the world if that happened, but it was accepted. But this wasn't even in the street, it was on the curbstone. So, of course, they couldn't get away with that. So the commission got after the FBI and they sent Lindall Shaneyfeld, a photographic expert, down. And accompanied by Robert Kimberling, who was the case agent in Dallas on the assassination, they went, they got the pictures, they spoke to the photographers, they went exactly to where a point was, and there it was. Except that it was a little bit different. Instead of a hole, you can see the difference in color, you can see the difference in texture. And I know because I've examined it at the archives. It's darker and smoother. Instead of a bullet hole or a nick made by a bullet, you've got it all smoothed over in darker color. So they, they dig it up, they take it back to Washington, they go through this incredible charade of making a spectro uh, scraping samples off and making a spectrographic analysis of what they know is not the evidence. They don't give a damn about the fact that underneath it is something that could have been a consequence that hadn't been covered over. They have no questions about why would somebody want to hide this when a president is killed. And uh, then they destroyed the spectrographic plate when I asked for it. At least they say they did. And the court said they produce it. They said it doesn't exist. And the explanation, not under oath, understand, just a possible explanation. They must have done it to save space. A 32nd of an inch in the, in the world's largest collection of files, which the FBI has, they're saving space with 1 32nd of an inch. But they get away with this in court. They did not want a missed shot. It would not fit and my testimony would prove that there was one missed shot that went over the limousine and hit the curb beside where I was standing. It did change the outcome of the warrant report. So late in the day, the commission were left with only two bullets to cause all the wounds to both Kennedy and Connolly, and one of those bullets had to have injured both men. To explain this, Arlen Specter, a counselor to the commission, created the single bullet theory, known to critics as the magic bullet. The infamous magic bullet. We have that bullet exiting from President Kennedy's neck, moving forward and leftward and downward. It now stops in midair 
it turns to the right, it comes back a full 18 inches, stops again, and then slams into John Connolly's back. It continues downward, and it goes through his wrist, and somehow they get that right wrist over to the left thigh. If you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see in the individual frames that John Connolly's right wrist is not near John Connolly's left thigh. The significance of this, the importance, cannot be exaggerated. It is impossible to overstate it. Why? Because the single bullet theory is the sine qua non of the Warren Commission report. It's not a matter of how much weight and credibility do you give to it. It's a matter of whether or not you have a single bullet theory that permits you to conclude that there was only one person firing, whether it was Oswald or anybody else in the world. If you don't have a single bullet theory, then you cannot have a sole assassin. And if you move to that point, then you're into conspiracy by definition. And that's why it had to stop with Oswald as a sole assassin. And that's why they came up with a single bullet theory.